This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So welcome everybody uh, to the Public History <coughs> Seminar tonight. It's my great pleasure to introduce Tobias Becker, um, who's going to uh, present today's paper. Uh, Tobias is a research fellow at the German Historical Institute, and he's previously worked um, on popular theatre in Berlin and London, and uh, his book, um, Inszenierte Moderne Populäres Theater in Berlin und London, just came out last year. His new project, uh, which he's working on at the German Historical Institute, uh, is on the nostalgia wave of the 1970s and 80s, and he's going to present uh, some of his results for us today. Um, he's also been involved in the preparation of an exhibition project at the German Historical Institute, which is on for another week on nostalgic objects. And uh, so, you know, if, if you're keen to go, this is your last chance. Uh, but for now, we're going to hear about the nostalgia wave uh, in the 1970s and 80s, homesick for yesterday. So welcome, Tobias. After the paper, there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A, and afterwards, we're going to go down to the common room for a glass of wine. Well, uh, thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present this project here at the Public History Seminar. I've started working on it about a year ago, and um, I hope to begin with my case studies uh, next year, so this is really a good moment to take a step back and discuss the general outline of the project. In the first part of my talk, um, I will be looking at the his at, um, at the history of the term nostalgia and the discourse about a nostalgia wave in the 1970s and 80s, how this wave was seen to manifest itself and how it was explained at the time. In the second part of the talk, I will be outlining the design of the project, its assumptions and the case studies, and it will take about uh, 40 minutes altogether. Um, two years ago, when I was in the last stages of finishing uh, my doctoral thesis, I went to a trip to Cornwall. As on similar occasions before, I was struck by the abundance of larger and smaller heritage sites and their importance for the tourism and the local economy. I was especially struck by how many people visited these sites and even more by the amateurs who maintained them. Of course, history plays an important part in tourism worldwide. Yet in Germany and on the continent more generally, most of these sites are maintained by national, regional and local governments. Institutions like the National Trust or English Heritage with their thousands of members do not exist there. Even more interesting are the myriad of small groups, societies and initiatives which run museums, heritage centers and steam railways like the one behind me or engage in living history or hist historical reenactments. Together with the success of period drama, this made me wonder what attracts <coughs> amateurs to the past, what they seek and what they find in it, why they spend their leisure time not only visiting historic sites, but collecting and preserving the remains of the past. Although I found much to admire in such devotion to the past, on a different level, it seemed to me not entirely healthy, but smacking of, yes, nostalgia. Uh, when I came back from Cornwall, I mentioned these observations to my friend Len here, uh, who recommended a number of books. Um, Patrick Wright's uh, living <coughs> um, on living in an old country, Robert Hewison's The Heritage Industry, David Lowenthal's The Past as a Foreign Country, and Raphael Samuel's Theatres of Memory. In essence, the core text of what retrospectively has been termed the heritage debate. Most of these books drew on nostalgia to account for the heritage boom since the 1970s. None of them, Samuel perhaps accepted, had anything good to say for nostalgia. On closer inspection, I found that this discourse was not limited to Britain, and also that it has not entirely abated. When historians use the term nostalgia today, they do so very much in the tradition of the 70s. Charles Mayer <coughs> compares it to Kitsch, Deepesh Chakrabarti and Tony Judd even call it a sin. I began to wonder, why did nostalgia have such a bad press, and was it really nostalgia the driving force behind the interest in the past, and if not, how do we explain why people, people who are not historians, are interested in the past? And with these questions in mind, I embarked on the project. In contrast to many other concepts, we know the exact year when nostalgia was born, 1688. In that year, the Swiss medical student Johannes Hofer published his dissertation, Nostalgia oder Heimweh. Seeking a medical term for homesickness, Heimweh is the German term for homesickness, he cobbled together the Greek words for home, nostos, and pain, algos. 
I don't want to go into the medical history too much. Uh, suffice it to say that the term and thereby the illness quickly gained entry into medical knowledge and stayed there until the middle of the 20th century. Although there was a temporal dimension to nostalgia from the beginning, the term generally denoted a yearning for a place and not for a period in the past. Slowly but gradually this began to change. According to the current online edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, the term came to signify a sentimental longing for or regretful memory of a period of the past from the 1900s onwards. By the interval period, the Times and the New York Times Digital Archive suggest nostalgia was more commonly used with regard to the past than with regard to a place, at least in the, the English-speaking world, of course. The dictionaries took a while to recognize the semantic shift. The fourth edition of the concise Oxford Dictionary of Current English published in 1951, still defined nostalgia as homesickness as a disease. The following version, published in 1964, was the first to feature, uh, to take account of the change of meaning. Homesickness as a disease, sentimental yearning for some period of the past. German dictionaries took even longer. In 1955, um, the edition of the Encyclopedia der Große Brockhaus, the entry for nostalgia simply read homesickness. In 1969, this was still the case, but with the amendment also yearning for the past. The postponed also makes it seem as if the new definition had been added hastily before publication to account for a recent change in meaning. In 1976, the new Myers Encyclopedia came out and featured not only a much longer entry on nostalgia, but also a two-page essay on the nostalgia wave since 1972. When the new, completely revised edition of the Brockhaus came out in 1979, the article on nostalgia had been much extended and now also referred to a nostalgia wave that had started around the middle of the 60s. Consequently, the semantic shift from homesickness to yearning for the past took place between the mid-60s and the mid-70s, or it began earlier in the interwar period, but at that time it was recognized by the dictionaries. At the same time, the term became much more widely used, as this Google Ngrams chart suggests. So um, here you can see from the 1900s onwards, but especially after the Second World War, the term nostalgia um, is much more widely used. And for the German language, it's even more pronounced. It's really the late 60s and the early 70s when it takes off. In The Guardian and The Observer, the use of the term doubled from decade to te decade, featuring over 500 times in the 50s and over 1,000 times in the 60s. In Germany, this trend was even more pronounced. In the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, the term occurred <coughs> only nine times in the 50s and 51 times in the 60s, but over 1,000 times in the 70s. The late 60s and early 70s also saw the beginning of a discourse on nostalgia intellectuals began to observe a wave of nostalgia. The first to do so, and indeed the first to coin this phrase, was the American futurologist Alvin Toffler. In his 1970 bestseller Future Shock, he noted, a tremendous wave of nostalgia in society. Antique furniture, posters from a bygone era, games based on the remembrance of yesterday's trivia, the revival of Art Nouveau, the spread of Edwardian styles, the rediscovery of such faded pop cult celebrities as Humphrey Bogart or W.C. Fields all mirror a psychological lust for the simpler, less turbulent past. And um, the term nostalgia wave, as you can see here, really is uh, something new in the 1970s and then became quickly common currency, at least among social commentators. In the same year, the journal Newsweek saw nostalgia sweeping the country like a Kansas twister. In 1971, Gerald Clark wondered in Time magazine, how much more nostalgia can America take? The answer was apparently a lot, because all through the 1970s and 80s, social commentators came up with similar diagnosis. In Britain, we find voices worrying about the nostalgia wave already in the mid-60s. Yet they were rather few and far between before the 70s. In 1974, the historian Michael Wood published an article on nostalgia in New Society. We have to live in the present, he wrote, but our minds are not in it. Once there was something called the modern, now is there only the past? Four years later, his colleague Douglas Johnson went one step further. 
The British national disease is not going on strike, nor it is, indulge, is it indulging in periodic fits of public morality. It is being nostalgic. Again, this discourse gained momentum in the 1980s. By then, nostalgia had, according to David Lowenthal, become the universal catchword for looking back, and according to Robert Hewson, a dominant characteristic of British society, a sickness that has reached fever point. In West Germany, one of the first to analyze the nostalgia wave was the historian Wolfgang Schievelbusch in 1973. In the same year, the journal Der Spiegel, detecting a rampant passion for the passé, featured a title story on nostalgia. So the nostalgia discourse or the writing on nostalgia was not limited to intellectuals and hybrid journals like New Society, but also found outlets in uh, more glossy magazines and newspapers. Uh, Life magazine had a cover story on nostalgia in 1971. So much for the diagnosis. Yet how did this alleged nostalgia wave manifest itself? What did the social commentators take issue with? Nostalgia first was, the, was discussed with regard to popular culture. According to Michael Wood, the world of popular music has simply become haunted by the 1950s. What began with the resurrection of forgotten 50s stars like Bill Haley soon became much more widespread if you think of, Sergeant, of the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, one of the examples that Wood mentions. Since the late 60s, a number of American and British films had been appearing in the cinema that harked back to the 50s, like American Graffiti. A similar trend was apparent on television with series like Happy Days in the US, Dad's Army in Britain. As the title Happy Days suggests, and as contemporary critics pointed out, mainstream 70s period drama did not just display a predilection for historical topics, settings and costumes, it was nostalgic in the sense that it expressed a distinctive mourning for the passing of time and sentimentalized the recent past. In the 80s, cultural commentators began to worry about the success of the conservation movement, the growth in the number of museums, the country house tourism and the rise of the antique trade, or what Robert Hewson polemically baptized the heritage industry. Like many other intellectuals and historians in Britain, and Germany, Hewson rejected what he, saw, what he saw as the commercialization of the past. <clears throat> he cautioned his readers that a country obsessed with its past was unable to face its future. In West Germany, the conservative philosopher Hermann Lübbe came to a similar <coughs> assessment, albeit with less pessimistic undertones. Never has a present been more oriented towards the past than our own, he stated. To prove his point, Lieber listed a number of recent developments, museums witnessed an increase of visitors, historical exhibitions became tourist attractions, um, and books on history featured on the bestseller list. The historian Jürgen Kocker came up with a similar list. Like their British counterparts, both used the term nostalgia. Lieber spoke of a contemporary nostalgia obsession, Kocker of a nostalgia wave which still has not faded away. How then did those obsessing about the nostalgia wave explain this tendency to look back in yearning? Many commentators, especially the most polemical, did not offer any explanation at all. Those who did often saw nostalgia as escapism, as a product of the present, the forlorn 1970s, as Michael Wood had it. Confronted with an economic downturn, fuel shortages, environmental destruction, and faced with an equally gloomy future, the younger generation in particular was seen to turn their backs to the here and now and wallow in an ostensibly better past. Some thought the nostalgia wave as a reaction not so much to the present than to the revolutionary 1960s. In Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, the American novelist Hunter S. Thompson compared living in the 60s to riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave, a wave that was not to last. So now, less than five years later, you can go up on a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west, and with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high water mark, that place where the wave finally broke and rolled back. And I think the nostalgia is quite uh, obvious in this quote. In his Sociology of Nostalgia, published in 1979, Fred Davis came to a similar conclusion. He saw the nostalgia wave of the 70s as a reaction to the massive identity dislocation of the 60s. Others stress the social and cultural change and ex especially its acceleration. For Toffler, future shock and hence the nostalgia wave was caused by the acceleration of change in our time. According to Hermann Lieber, the speed of change of our civilization, hitherto never experienced, 
was responsible for a loss of familiarity and nostalgia was an attempt to compensate for in increasing insecurity. Both Toffler and Lippe were convinced that the acceleration of change had caused a rupture between the past and the present. According to Toffler, the mechanical age had forced men to develop a new sense of time. Lippe, drawing on the historian Reinhard Koselek, observed a contraction of the present as a result of a drifting apart of the space of experience and the horizon of expectations. In short, our present is so different from the past that past experience become increasingly useless and the future will yet be so different from the present that it is impossible to come up with long-ranging expectations. A similar idea had been formulated by the British historian John Plump in 1969. The new methods, new processes, new forms of living of scientific and industrial society, he wrote in The Death of the pa Past, have no sanction in the past and no roots in it. The past becomes, therefore, a matter of curiosity, of nostalgia, a sentimentality. In essence, the continuity between past and present had broken down. The past truly had become a foreign country. You could visit it as, out of curiosity or for relaxation, but there was nothing worthwhile to bring back into the present. So far, I've tried to reconstruct the discourse on nostalgia, or rather on the nostalgia wave in the 1970s and 80s. I've shown how the meaning shifted of the term, where nostalgia was found and how it was accounted for. Now I want to sketch out the outline of the project by starting with three hypotheses. Um, the first hypothesis is, is rather banal. Despite all the talk about national diseases and national peculiarities, the nostalgia discourse was obviously crossing borders. So far I've been looking at the US, Britain and West Germany, but I'm sure similar observations and assessments were made in other countries as well. And of course, the observers were not independent from one another. Alvin Toffler's book in particular, a bestseller in Britain and West Germany as much as in the US, clearly was very influential. Therefore, it makes sense to choose a transnational perspective. Only then will it be possible to account for similarities and differences, dependencies and influences. My second hypothesis is that using the term nostalgia was a rhetorical strategy. With the emergence of new actors in the field of history, the witness, the mass media, amateur historians and so on, professional historians hold over the interpretation of the past suddenly was no longer uncontested. They reacted to this development by accusing other actors of nostalgia, thus reinstating their own interpretational sovereignty over the past. Yet, if the nostalgia panic, as one might call it, was an overreaction by historians, this calls into question whether we should take it seriously at all. Despite such objections, and that is my third hypothesis, the nostalgia discourse of the 70s and 80s cannot be simply dismissed. Whether or not nostalgia was the right term to describe what was going on, something clearly was going on. Compared with the 60s, more people took an active interest in the past, as a consequence, history became more popular, more democratic and more commercial. Instead of using nostalgia as an analytical term and to write a history of nostalgia in post war Europe as I'd planned initially, I've now opted for a bottom-up approach. I've decided to examine more closely selected phenomena, phenomena mentioned in the discourse through five case studies. The conservation movement, the antique trade, family history, local museums and historical reenactments. For each of the five phenomena, I want to find out who was interested in the past, in what periods or aspects they were interested in spe specifically, and what mot motivated them. As the chapter title suggests, I'm particularly interested in practices, how amateurs engaged with the past, what historical methods they appropriated, what they did with them, and to what end. My first case study looks at the conservation movement. The 1960s, the heyday of urban <coughs> modernism, were not only concerned with conservation, uh, sorry, uh, um, were not overly concerned with conservation to say the least. Modernist planners and architects believing in the functional city rejected the organic European city of the 19th century and its historicist architecture. Wartime destruction, population growth, economic boom and the welfare state gave them the opportunity to implement their ideas. Historic buildings, such as the Houston Arch behind me, had to yield. In their stead, tower blocks like Belfon Tower in London rose into the sky, while outside the big cities, new towns like Milton Keynes sprang up. 
From the mid-60s onwards, opposition against urban modernism and the destruction of the old began to grow. In Britain, for instance, in the guise of the Victorian Society, one of many local and regional initiatives which tried to preserve historic buildings, and with some success because uh, St. Pancrates Hotel and Station, in contrast to um, the Euston Arch, was not demolished but uh, was listed in 67. Conservation transformed in, from an elitist concern into a popular movement. Surprisingly, the professional conservators reacted with skepticism. Far from welcoming the support, German conservators, for instance, sounded a cautionary note. Um, as you can see here, for them, um, this popular conservation movement was, um, <coughs> was an outgrowth of the nostalgia wave, and they, they used this term, nostalgia. Uh, while they saw the rise of the conservation movement um, as, an, as caused by the nostalgia wave, critics of nostalgia often too on the conservation movement as an example. Nostalgia, when organized, can be positively harmful, opined Douglas Johnson. And the most obvious example of this is the conservation movement. Here we have groups of people who tend to be opposed to any vision of the future. They wish to stop things from happening. They wish to prevent old buildings from, going, from being pulled down and new buildings from being put up. And all this because they fear the future, they dislike the present and they think things were better in the past. Many of them wish to return to some sort of rural Acadia where everything was beautiful, peaceful and unpolluted. Today we may perhaps moan about conservation when it stands between us and our roof extension, but we would hardly see it as a project of nostalgia or a threat to the present. So the conservation movement is one example where we can see changing attitudes from the 60s to the 70s and then again to today. My second case study is concerned with the antique trade. While the ideal private home in the 1960s looked like a space station transplanted to Croydon, the 1970s saw a return to old-fashioned furniture. Once kitschy Victoriana were suddenly in great demand. All over London, antique shops, stalls and flea markets sprang up, which catered to a mass market of middle-class bohemians and American tourists rather than to a wealthy elite, while on television shows like Going for a Song or Antiques Roadshow found an audience. Simultaneously, family, uh, sorry, oh, okay, that's Camden, uh, Camden Passage, um, where an antique market was established in the 1960s. Um, simultaneously, family <coughs> history became a popular hobby. Although family history is rarely mentioned in the nostalgia discourse, probably because it was much less conspicuous than the other examples, it fits the overall framework of the project very well. While Alex Haley's 1976 book Roots is often seen as a trigger for a new kind of family history, a host of genealogical guidebooks addressed to a wider readership began to be published from the late 60s onwards. And uh, with these examples you can see how in the 50s and 60s, early 60s, it was still very serious using terms like heraldry and genealogy. And then from the, uh, from the 70s on and in the 80s, it becomes much more glossy, a uh, coffee table book-like, and the readers are addressed uh, personally, your family history. What, in contrast to family history, figured a lot in the nostalgia discourse were museums. In this case, a study I'm looking at small local museums, heritage centers, or Heimatmuseen, as they are called in Germany, which were often founded and run by amateurs, as for example in Chester, where the first British Heritage Center was established in 1975. My final case study is devoted to historical reenactments and particularly to the Sealed Knot. Founded in 1968, it is the oldest and to this day one of the largest reenactment societies in Britain, with sister associations all over the continent. Admittedly, none of these phenomena were peculiar to the second half of the 20th century. All of them can be traced back to the 19th century, sometimes even to the 18th century. The conservation movement was founded by William Morris and Octavia Hill. Antiques were brought back to Britain from the Grand Tours. Family history is a modern version of genealogy. The museum was an invention of the Enlightenment. Even historical reenactments can be traced back to the late Victorian and Edwardian pageant um, uh, Tom is uh, working on. Yet, if there are continuities, there are also differences. The meaning of conservation has changed as much as the meaning of the word antique. Family history serves other purposes than genealogy and so on. 
In general, until the 20th century, such practices were confined to an elite, to people with either money or education or both. Before the 20th century, there was also, with the exception of Nietzsche, no real criticism of the occupation with the past. Traditionally, it was the new that had to defend itself, not the old. The nostalgia discourse of the 70s and 80s was, for the first time, as far as I can see, that um, being interested in the past came under critical scrutiny. As this short overview of the, nostalgia, of, the nostal of the case studies has shown, there's much evidence that the attitude towards the past changed fundamentally between the mid-60s and the mid-70s. The question is how this transformation can be explained. I want to propose three very preliminary explanations which partly built on the discourse of the 70s and 80s. Firstly, the interest in the past in the 70s was a reaction to the disinterest in the past prevalent in the 1950s and 60s. The conservation movement here is a case in point. The obsession with conservation in the 60s was rooted in the destructions of the 50s and the 60s, as well as those of the Second World War. Secondly, the interest in history can be understood as a result of acceleration. It is astonishing to see how over the course of the last decade the cultural diagno diagnosis of the 70s, perhaps never entirely dead, have resurfaced. Alvin Toffler's uh, Future Shock, for instance, has been updated by American media theorist Douglas Rushkoff. In his eyes, the times change so fast now that it is not the future anymore but the present that engenders shock. A subtler analysis can be found in the theory of social acceleration by German sociologist Hartmut Rosa, which is unthinkable without Lübbe and Koselleck. With them, Rosa argues that the space of experience and the horizon of expectations have drifted apart, resulting in the contraction of a present. This influences how we understand and perceive present, past and future. Interestingly, Rosa also uses the term nostalgia. According to him, almost every search of acceleration is followed by, by the nostalgic desire for the lost slow world whose slowness first becomes a distinct quality in retrospect. At the same time, acceleration immune phenomena gain nostalgic value and make more enticing promises the rarer they become. In short, we like to take part in reenactments or ride on steam trains because the alleged slower past offers us a relief from our hectic present. Like Lübbe, Rosa grants nostalgia a positive compensatory, compensatory function. Independently from <coughs> Rosa, but also building on Kaselek, the French historian François Atok came to a very similar conclusion in his book, The Regimes of Historicity. Atok, too, is convinced that the distance between the space of experience and the horizon of expectation has become so great that a complete rupture has taken place and the production of historical time has come to a halt. Whereas Rosa does not provide a convincing chronology for his narrative, Atok sees the 1960s as the high point and the end of modern, future-oriented regime of historicity. Since then, the present has become the all-consuming center a massive, overwhelming, omnipresent present that has no horizon other than itself, daily creating and the, the past and the future that day after day it needs. And with that, a new regime becomes established. Um, instead of futurism, that is what he says we had in the 1960s and before that, uh, presentism takes its place. History, which stresses continuity, was replaced by heritage, which has never thrived on continu continuity, but on the contrary from ruptures and questioning the order of time. What is surprising about Rosa's and Artok's diagnosis of, the pres of our present is that their conclusions hardly proceed beyond Toffler, Lübbe and Koselek. There are two explanations for that. Either we are still coping with the crisis of time that occurred in the 1970s, or the 2000s saw a renewed another crisis of time which has led us to recover the text from the 70s. In both cases, however, the understanding and perception of time has radically changed in the 1960s, and this has altered our engagement with the past. The nostalgia discourse marks the moment when this became obvious. Just some short concluding remarks. Um, um, every project has to answer the test, um, why should we care and why is this important? And uh, I have four short, um, short answers to that. 
firstly, studying the nostalgia wave makes sense because the discourse surrounding it still informs how we think about nostalgia today. And if you think back to the quotes from Charles Mayer and Tony Chattipis Chakravarti from the beginning, that is still quite obvious how the 70s discourse um, informs how we think about nostalgia still. The term nostalgia has crystallized into a cliché that historians use to brush off other approaches to the past instead of thinking about what nostalgia means in contemporary society. Secondly, while there is very little historical research in, on nostalgia, other disciplines, sociology, psychology, anthropology and particularly literature, culture, cultural media and fashion studies have produced a lot of research in recent years. The books you can see behind me are all from 2014 and 15 and um, are still only the tip of the iceberg. As most of these studies I are primarily interested in the place of nostalgia in the here and now, um, they, they do not historically contextualize nostalgia. At the same time, however, they draw on the texts from the <coughs> 1970s and 80s, again, without putting them into historic context. And I think that makes it necessary um, to, to contextualize the discourse and how we speak about nostalgia in the 20th century. Thirdly, studies on public history, often even when written by historians, uh, also seem to reflect a lack of historical contextualization. While there are a number of essays on who do you think you are, there's very little historical research on family history. Reenactments are studied from the point of view of theater and performance studies, but I know little historical studies about how reenactments um, historically developed and how they changed over the course of the 20th century. Finally, I hope the project will also contribute to the history of the 1970s and 80s and to the growing literature on how we perceive and understand time and how that has changed since uh, the Second World War. Rosa and Hartog still remain very abstract in what they think about it and generalize, and I think that maybe these case studies could put their theories um, to the test. Thank you very much. Thank you.